Hey, everybody. Welcome back to A Late Show. My guest tonight is an Emmy award-winning actor and rapper you know from Nightcrawler, Rogue One, and The Night Of. He now stars in the film Sound of Metal. Please welcome back to A Late Show, Riz Ahmed. Riz, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, man. Good to see you again. Well, Riz, first of all, congratulations on the BAFTA nomination. That was just this morning, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, we got um, a couple of nominations for Sound of Metal and also for Mogul Mowgli, which is uh, a, a movie uh, that isn't out yet in the U.S., but came out in the U.K., I, so it was cool. I always like hearing how people heard that they got the nomination. Were you expecting it? Were like, or were, like, were you, were you, were you waiting to find out, or was it a total surprise and you didn't even think about this was happening today? I mean, you can't really be expecting it. It's like there are no promises in life anymore, right? Everything's so unpredictable. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it was like on London time and I'm out on the West Coast, so it happened in the middle of the night. So um, it's kind of good in a way. You just kind of sleep through any of the anxiety and you just wake up and see if there's uh, a bunch of text messages on your phone. And so you look at your phone and it's just stacked with messages and you know something good must have happened? Something good or something really bad. That's the <laughs> issue, right? You look at your phone, you see all these notifications, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to look at that. You know, could, could go either way. Well, this is this has been a, a tough year. As I was just saying earlier today, um, this Friday will be a year since we had to leave our theater because of uh, COVID, COVID infections here in the United States. And this year has been a, an extraordinarily difficult for so many people, but it's actually brought you an enormous amount of success and, and good news. You released a, a, a new album, two films. You're working with the Obamas on a film adaptation. You signed an Amazon production deal. And best of all, you got married. How, how do you make sense of, of, the, of the, 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 the many ups and the downs of this year? For you? It's crazy, isn't it? Because on the one hand, yeah, it has been a really difficult year. And as you can tell, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I have trouble sitting still. I'm always like to be doing something. And the toughest thing for me this year was sitting with myself and, um, you know, kind of being forced to do nothing. In some ways, a privilege. You know, I'm not out there like these doctors and nurses saving lives. So I'm grateful for that. But one of the things that that quiet brought me was some clarity on, you know, where we spend our time and energy. You know, we, we, I think a lot of us have had this realization, we spend a lot of time chasing stuff that probably in the end doesn't really matter. What matters is, is your well-being, your health, your connection to others. And it's kind of given me a lot more clarity on the kind of work that I want to be doing. And so even though it stopped me in my tracks, it gave me a lot of clarity and I was able to kind of follow through on that and, and, and make a bunch of work that I feel like represents where I'm at right now. One of, one of the things that's great about music is that you can do it anywhere. You can do it by yourself. You, you, you can do it in collaboration by sending files to each other. Was that something, were you able to put some of your focus into that because normal like uh, television or film production was so curtailed? That was a part of it, yeah. I mean, one of the things I was gonna do was uh, tour my album, The Long Goodbye, but obviously COVID shut that all down. So what we ended up doing was a live stream performance um, from an abandoned theater in San Francisco and I filmed it myself and it ended up, you know, sometimes these limitations make you innovate. So I ended up being kind of a one-man theater show, but also a gig, but also kind of like a short film because we, we, we filmed it. So, um, yeah, it was kind of interesting. But for me, the thing that, you know, this year kept bringing me back to is like, really, what's the point? You know, there's, there's, there's a whole big picture that's so scary right now. Like, you better be making work that you think makes some kind of difference or means something to, to you. And for me, you know, both Sound of Metal, All the Long Goodbye, they're trying to remind us that there's no such thing as us and them, you know, which is important to hold on to in such a divided time. It's, it's just us, you know, that's what all stories remind you is, you know, you start off watching a character that you feel like you can't relate to and it's so different to you. And at the end of it, you realize there's a, there's a kind of core of emotion and humanity that we all share. And, and so I guess, I feel really clear that I want to be making work like that that reminds us that, that we're in this together. Well, let's talk about The Sound of Metal. Um, your performance, as, as I said, the BAFTA nomination this morning is getting great praise. What is, who do you play and what's it about? Yeah, it was a project that was so close to my heart, so lucky to be a part of. Um, it's by a first time director called Darius Marder, who is a legit genius. And the movie is a story of Ruben, who's a, a kind of a punk metal drummer who suddenly loses his hearing. 
And when he loses his hearing, he loses his identity, his job, and his relationship, because his bandmate is his girlfriend. They live together in a mobile studio RV. So his world falls apart. And kind of like what we've all been going through with COVID, this health crisis forces him into a kind of lockdown, goes to a rehab center, and he's forced to reassess what really matters. We have a, a, a clip here. Can you tell us what's going on? Yeah, so this is um, the point in the movie where Ruben is trying to get cochlear implant surgery. It's surgery that allows you to kind of simulate sound and trick your brain into thinking it's hearing. And, um, yeah, he's, he's kind of risked a lot and put a lot on the line to try and get his hearing back. Jim? You, you spent seven months uh, preparing for this film, learning American Sign Language. What, what was that process like, and what's the most important thing you learned about the deaf community? It was one of the most enriching and mind-blowing experiences of my life. I'm so grateful to my sign instructor, Jeremy Lee Stone, who was really my mentor in introducing me to deaf culture. And really the biggest takeaway for me was that deafness isn't a disability, it is a culture. It's a way of being in the world, you know. Um, deaf people aren't hearing impaired. We're impaired because we don't speak sign language. Sign language is such a, such a rich form of expression. Um, I actually feel like the deaf community taught me the true meaning of listening. You know, listening isn't something you just do with your ears, it's something you do with your attention and your, your energy um, and holding space for someone else's energy. Um, Jeremy would always teach, tell me that there's a saying in the deaf community that hearing people are emotionally repressed because we hide behind feeling, uh, we hide behind words. We use words to mask our true feelings. And I wasn't sure what he was talking about until I became more and more fluent in sign language and I'd find myself tearing up, communicating about things in sign language that I could just gloss over with words. And that's because when you're speaking in sign, it's just so much more connected and, and visceral. You're embodying what you're communicating. So I, I learned sign language, but I also learned what real communication is and what real listening is from the deaf community. And I'm so grateful for that. I, I have to imagine that picking up, I don't know how, how much facility you have with languages, but taking up another language, especially that has uh, a, um, a, a different form of vocabulary than uh, the, those of us not in the deaf community are used to. What, did you make mistakes? I mean, like, were there any epic uh, mess ups? Yeah, yeah. Um, my, my sign name, which is something you're given by the deaf community, um, you know, people who know you after a while. My sign name is is up. And how so that's, how, that's how would you sign that? Name. How would you sign that? Well, um, the sign up is like this, right? So you kind of got these, and you're like, you know, you up. And what I kept doing is, I didn't know the sign for like, um, I'm thinking. You know, when you run out of words, you can actually kind of go like that, or you know, maybe you're thinking, but. Um, I just, I didn't have that, even the vocabulary for that. So every time I ran out of words, I'd just be like. <laughs> and um, Christine Sun Kim, the deaf um, artist, um, kind of clocked that and went, you know what? That's your name. You know, you, you're playing the drums. You always talking your name up and R-I-Z. So your sign name is. And it just shows you how am amazing and elegant a language is. You've got the drums, you've got R-I-Z, you've got half up. And that's my sign name, so I wear it with pride. Um, uh, yeah, that's me. Which was harder, learning American Sign Language or the drums? Because I understand you had to learn the drums for the part. Yeah, I mean, sign language was intense, you know, seven months, many hours every day, but uh, the drums was the same, but I feel like the drums was harder for me, much harder, because I stupidly thought I would be good at the drums because I'm a rapper and I've got some idea of rhythm. Couldn't have been further from the truth. There's difference between rhythm and coordination. And um, my, my drum teacher, Guy Licata, has the patience of a saint. And, and really, 
it got pretty psychological, man. Two dudes just in like a weird basement studio in Brooklyn uh, in the heat of the summer, just usually stripped down to underwears and socks, just like staring at each other, smashing drums. Um, it, got, it got pretty intense. It got a little bit of apocalypse now and there. So yeah, it was very psychological. I think the thing with the drums is you don't play the drums, you have to let them play you. And that's what I, I kind of learned in the end. Well, we, we have a drummer in our family, and he doesn't go anywhere without some sort of ear protection in case he, in case he sits in or anything. He always even has either the full headphones or the earplugs on his keychain. Did you take care of your ears? Yes, you've got to. I mean, that's part of what the film's about, but it kind of weirdly backfired on me because I got so used to wearing um, these earplugs that um, I kind of stopped being able to sleep you know, I was preparing in New York without earplugs, but then I kept sleeping through my alarm. So then I started getting late for work. So then I couldn't sleep out of anxiety for that. So the whole first couple of weeks of shooting, I just kept buying new mattresses. For some reason, I thought that maybe it's the, the problem was with the mattresses that I was sleeping on. So um, a, whole, a whole wormhole of neuroses opened up around those. It was an intense process, man. You had to be there at the time. Uh, uh, well, Riz, it was great to see you. Before we go, I, kn I know you're, you're a native of the UK. I just want to know, are you okay with what's happening with Piers Morgan, that he had to, he had to quit Good Morning Britain? Are, are you going to be okay that he's not going to be there anymore? You know what? Uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> nothing could be further from my mind than Piers Morgan. All right, good. Good, so you're going to be okay. Sound of Metal is on Amazon Prime Video now. Riz Ahmed, everybody. We'll be right back with a performance by Janelle Monet. Thanks for coming.